So the other day I was, um, I was listening to some music I hadn't listened to in a long time. Um, and you know how sometimes if you hear music that you've played off and on for a long time, it brings back memories, associations from previous times. And this piece of music um, just brought me back to the time I first listened to this piece of music, and it was when I was sort of meeting and dating my wife for the first time, and um, just brought back all those memories, you know, the joy, the excitement, young love, you know, um, the passion of love and romance. And, and of course, that's the kind of thing that uh, when people think about Valentine's Day, that's kind of what they focus on, the romance, the love, the flowers, and, you know, all that, all that good stuff. And, and uh, that stuff is wonderful, isn't it? I mean, we, we love that part of romantic relationships. But um, we also know, if we've been in any kind of relationship for very long, um, that it's not all roses and song. Um, relationships have their ups and downs and their challenges. There's this wonderful book by Tim Lane and Paul Tripp called Relationships, a mess worth making. Um, relationships with human beings are messy, but they're worth it. And so what I'd like to do this morning is focus on the worth making part, not as much on the messy part. Um, and here when I'm thinking of relationships, folks, I'm not just thinking of marriage or romance, romantic relationships. I'm thinking more broadly, and that's the title of my sermon, The Blessings of Companionship. Um, the companionship that does come through the, through the marriage relationship, but it also comes through family, it comes through friends, it comes through God's people. And so that's what I want to focus on today, but I think it's important, we're looking at Ecclesiastes, and I know over the years you've heard me from time to time preach on Ecclesiastes, um, Ecclesiastes presents these blessings of companionship, but this is Ecclesiastes, so we always have to do it with a, um, with a caveat, because in Ecclesiastes, what's the thesis of the book? The teacher in Ecclesiastes says, Every, meaningless, meaningless, everything's meaningless, and he's talking about life under the sun. If you're disassociated from your purpose in life being fearing God and keeping his commandments, worshiping the living God, if all you're living for is life under the sun, you're going to just find it meaningless and frustrating. So our relationships cannot be the means of finding purpose and meaning in life. But when understood relatively under the final value and love and worship of the living God, they are a blessing. Not the ultimate means, but it's certainly a blessing. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to consider um, two passages actually in Ecclesiastes, primarily the one we just read, Ecclesiastes 4. But we're also going to look at a, a text in chapter 9 as well. We're going to look at six blessings found we can find in companionship. And then um, after looking at those six blessings, I want to just kind of drive it home um, by some points of application, okay? But let's look at the six blessings of companionship. And so we'll start with chapter 4. And um, we read, you know, verses 9 through 12, but I want to actually pull back a little bit to the larger context. Beginning with verse 4, the teacher, as he kind of often does, is he, he, he has a rough shift of focus. And, and so beginning in verse 4, he focuses actually on on labor, on toil under the sun. And he says in verse 4 that all toil and all skill and work come from man's envy of his labor, or his neighbor. This is vanity and striving after the wind. He says basically people who are driven, the kind of workaholic, driven to get ahead, driven to make it, be successful, typically, he says, it's driven by competition. Essentially, I want more than my neighbor has. I want to be the big dog. I want to be number one. 
And of course, that's fleeting because even if you make it to the top, you don't stay there very long. And uh, most likely you won't make it to the top. And even if you did and stayed there for a little bit of time, you wouldn't find it nearly as uh, meaningful as you thought. But then he goes in the exact opposite direction, verse 5, when he says, the fool holds his hands and eats his own flesh. In other words, somebody who's foolish will say, yeah, I'm not into that competition and that toil stuff. I'm just going to not do anything. Instead of using my hands, I'm just going to fold them. Eh, not going to work. And what's he say? He eats his own flesh. He, di- he, he starves to death. So you don't want to be the crazy workaholic trying to be number one to the exclusion of everything else, nor do you want to be the fool who starves to death because you don't try anything. And so he brings them together in verse 6. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. In other words, yes, you need to work. You need to toil under the sun. You need to take provision for yourself so you can live, so you don't starve to death. But don't so devote yourself to striving for success, to being a workaholic, that you literally sap yourself out of all life's blessings. Don't go crazy working to death because then you miss out on some wonderful blessings in life like relationships. And so with that in mind, he goes to verse, verses um, 7 and 8 and gives an example of somebody too busy for relationships. He's just too busy working. Look at verse 7 and 8. Again, I saw under the sun one person who has no other He's alone, neither son nor brother. Yet there's no end to his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches. You see, got to get more, 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 more. Leech, you know, get me more, give me, give me, give me, give me. Got to get more. So he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Here you have a lonely miser who is striving so much to get ahead and get more and more and more that he doesn't have the opportunity for any enjoyment in relationship. He's he's alone. The only friend he has is his money. And despite his wealth, the teacher says he's miserable. It's pathetic. He's a pathetic figure. Companionship delivers you, combats that kind of loneliness. With companions, you're not alone. I don't know about you, but I'm an introvert. I like to be alone. I need my time alone. If if I'm constantly around people all the time, I go nuts. I need some time to just be alone. But too much, that's terrible too. I don't want to be alone that much. Um, when I, I've had the chance over the last 12 years or so to, get, to travel that I, I'd never be able to afford to travel like I've been able to um, because I travel with Moody. We have these, this, we've had this study abroad program so I've gotten to go to different parts of Europe and, and, and Israel and, and to bring students. And, you know, we teach classes and they tour and everything. It's been great. Um, and you're spending, you know, I get to spend time with students, but um, my wife's not usually able to go with me. So there is actually a lot of downtime where I'm just kind of alone. You know, students are studying or they're out and about and that sort of thing. And I find that um, after a short time, I'm like, man, I really miss my family. This is why, you know, people who are in solitary confinement for day after day after day after day after day can go mad because God created us as social beings. We are reflecting of him. Father, Son, and Spirit are an intimate, eternal relationship with one another, and he made us to be social creatures too. And this is why God says in Genesis 2, it's not good for Adam, man, to be alone. 
And so friendship, and certainly marriage, can combat loneliness. Loneliness that we're not made for. So that's one of the blessings of companionship. It helps to combat loneliness. Second, companionship lightens the load. This is verse 9. Look at verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. See, companions make labor easier while increasing reward. You know the statement, many hands make light work. Yeah, the more help you have, the more efficient things are, the more you can get done, the easier it is. Uh, my daughters over the years have participated in a, in a program, and it's all in the Chicagoland area. It's called uh, Christian Youth Theater, CYT. Some of you may be familiar with it. And, um, you know, they teach theater arts, they have classes, but they also do plays and, and musicals. And so um, if you have a, a child who's in one of the musicals, you have to, as a parent, you have to volunteer. It's a required volunteer to help out in some area of the production. In my case, you know, we're not real, you know, artistic people, so we, we usually volunteer for the custodial crew. We clean up after the play, you know. So, and my wife and I, you know, she'll go sometimes, I'll go other, we just kind of switch off. But I remember one time about a year ago, and I, please, don't read this as I'm a martyr, okay? I'm not pr trying to present myself as a martyr here, but I was a martyr. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I showed up to clean, and I, you know, and we would just kind of jump in. We knew what to do, we just kind of jump into it. So I started jumping in doing it, and I'm working away, and I was like, this is funny, I'm not seeing any of the other parents. And I kept working away, and working, and about halfway through, I realized I'm the only one that showed up tonight. I don't know what happened. I don't know if there was a, a snafu with the schedule. I don't know. They usually had three or four of us, and it was just me. And so it was kind of like, whoa! So uh, I was real. I really worked hard that night, um, it, but it got so late that. Um, the director and stuff started helping me because they couldn't leave until I was done. So, But it was such a contrast to the next time I went um, where a bunch of <laughs> parents showed up and we just got through it like, like that. And, um, you know, having a companion makes work less, right? It reduces the load and makes your time more profitable. And that's his point here. Another blessing of companionship is in verse 10. For if they fall, so he's talking about two companions at work, if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, and he has not another to lift him up. So this is actually closely related to the previous point. Not only does having a, a fellow, a, a companion, help you in your labor and make it more efficient, but also if they're, if you, if you, if you, um, are in time of need, they're there to help you. Think of the times in your own life when you had a spouse or friend or something help you in time of need, right? Um, I think oftentimes of how, many, how often my wife has come pick me up at the airport when I flew in from wherever I was going or, or you know, took me to, to a doctor's appointment when I, I couldn't drive myself or... Um, to help take care of me when I'm sick. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that we get into problems where we need help. And to have a companion, somebody you can count on in time of need. The person that you can, when they ask for, call in case of emergency number, that's the person you give. That's what we're talking about. Companionship helps in time of need. There's a fourth blessing, companionship. It's in verse 11. Companionship brings comfort in harsh times. Verse 11, again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Now, don't misunderstand the imagery here. This isn't about a sexual relationship, and it's not necessarily about husband and wife laying together. The imagery here has to do with traveling. Um, imagine if you're traveling... Um, in, in the area of Israel, 
and you're going through a more desert region, and you know at night it, gets, it can get really cold. So traveling companions could often snuggle next to each other to help keep themselves warm. If you're alone, you don't have anybody else's body heap to kind of warm you, you know, from the back or whatever. So it, it, is, it is helpful to have a companion to share body heat with, and it's really cold. That's the point. And certainly that's true in, in a trip, but probably what, what the teacher is getting at here is, is, is more of an emotional sense, that, that when you're dealing with difficult or uh, emotionally difficult times, it's, it's just nice to have emotional support and comfort in times of coldness, in times of difficulty. I remember a um, number of years ago, um, I, was, I was serving as our, uh, the church at the time, I was an elder, and um, the board unanimously, we made a very difficult decision that we knew was gonna be deeply unpopular. And boy, was it deeply unpopular. <laughs> um, and we got a lot of blowback. And, um, and it was nice to have made the decision in unity as elders so we could kind of watch each other's back. But what I really remember is how supportive my wife was um, when she knew how, what we were going through. And she was just wonderfully supportive. And that was really a great emotional bolster. It's like, well, everybody in my church hates me, but my wife still loves me kind of a thing. Um, and I think about this in a broader sense. Um, think about, you know, I think of times when I lost my mother, and I lost my sister, when I lost my dad, and just the companionship of family and friends in those times of bereavement. It's good to be together when you're grieving like that, you know? And we all know this. This is, this is what... This is what companionship brings. It, brings. it brings comfort in times of sorrow and in sad times. Another blessing of companionship is in verse 12. Companionship gives strength in dangerous times. Verse 12. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. So probably the picture here is of a lone traveler being attacked by a thief and a robber. Okay, if you're by yourself, you're a whole lot more vulnerable, particularly against somebody who's like a professional thief and robber who, does the, who likes to beat people up to get stuff. But you're far less vulnerable if you have a companion, much less a group. You know, at, at, you know, at Moody, students are told um, that when, when they're out and about in Chicago to make sure they're not traveling alone to go at least with a companion, with group. That's just, it's just wiser. And, and that's, that's the picture here. Uh, this, this analogy of a threefold cord is not quickly broken is just a reminder. If you have one cord, it's a lot easier to break but if you have three of them or more wrapped and woven together, they're going to be a lot stronger, a rope, essentially, right? And that's the principle here. Um, uh, a companion or companions can, can, can help foster protection. I don't remember when it was. Relatively recently, within the last year or two, I, I was, I don't know where I even came across it, but I came across the video. Uh, somebody had filmed, um, had been on safari, in Africa, and with, just with their phone, they filmed this, this kill. Um, there, was these, there was this herd of gazelle, and this pride of lions was stalking them. And then they pounced, and, you know, the gazelles would just all take off. And it was very sad. I don't know. I still think about it today, and I'm just squeamish about it. It makes me feel bad. But there was this one younger gazelle that gets caught by the pride. And I won't go into the details of what happens to that, that poor thing. It was terrible. But the point was, the assumption of this, of this blessing is that in difficult times, a companion's going to stick with you. 
They're not going to abandon you. Uh, the gazelles didn't stand together. They, like, scattered. And it's like, oh, too bad for that one, but at least I'm safe. A companion, a true companion, sticks with you in times of danger, doesn't take off and says, well, you're on your own, man. And that's why, you know, you, those of you who served in the military, you know, in the military, unit cohesion is important because you want somebody watching your back when you're in war. I remember, um, I remember when my, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter was born. And when I think of somebody who sticks by you, no matter what, I think of a mama bear, a mom, her little baby, okay? Nobody's going to get in the way of my, me and my baby and attack my baby, right? So when my daughter was born, um, she, was, she was born prematurely and she was jaundiced. And so the, the doctor's saying, you know, we just need to keep her in the hospital um, so we can break down the, you know, the billy room and so she's okay. And so, you know, you can just leave her here and you can come back tomorrow, but go home and get some sleep. And I was like, my wife is like, are you kidding me? I'm not, I'm not leaving that, my daughter anywhere without me. And she stuck with her like glue for several days. She was exhausted. But she was not leaving her, my, our daughter. Now me, I went home and slept. <laughs> my wife just stayed put, you know. Uh, mama bear, and that's just, that's a beautiful thing. But again, that's kind of, companionship adds strength in times of danger. Not that my daughter was in danger, but you know, you get the point. Let me give you one other advantage and blessing, a companionship, and it's in chapter 9. It's in chapter 9, but I think it's important to bring this one out too. And that's this, can, companionship can bring joy, it can bring joy. Um, let me, let me, before we kind of get into verses 9 and 10 are the key ones I want to focus on, but let me just give you the context because I help you really sense how we get here. Um, the teacher starts out in the way he often does with some really bad news, you know, and that's in verses 1 through 3. Guess what? Death is inevitable. You will not escape it. Okay. But in verses 4 to 6, he says, but since death is inevitable... We might ask the question, so is there any advantage in living? And he says, yeah, there is. There is. Um, in fact, he says, a live dog is better than a dead lion. Now, in ancient Israel, dogs were disgusting. You know, we have a dog. We love dogs. Dogs are pets. In ancient Israel, yuck. And not, lions were, you know, considered noble. Well, better to be a wretched live dog than a dead lion. You know why? Because at least the dog's still alive. And why is that important? Because you can still enjoy God's blessings in life under the sun if you're still alive. Because once you die, in terms of the blessings of life under the sun, this is not talk about eternity, but in terms of that, that's over. So there are some blessings. So with that in mind, he gets in verse 7 to say, so enjoy the blessings that you have in life under the sun. Go, eat your bread with joy, verse 7. Drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. You know what? It can honor the Lord if you enjoy, not, you know, not as your God, but you can enjoy the good gifts he's given. Do so. In fact, verse 8, let your garments be always white. Let, your, let not oil be lacking on your head. Wearing garments of white, putting oil on your head, probably indication of festivities. Enjoy it. If God has given you good gifts, enjoy that. And that sets the stage for his exhortation in verse 9, which is for us. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Sheol is simply the grave. In other words, look. Enjoy your companionship with your, with your spouse while you can. Enjoy that. Find enjoyment in it. There is enjoyment. There is blessing. There can be in relationships. Now, Ken, the specific exhortation here is enjoy marital love. 
But I think, it's, I think it is appropriate to say, by extension, that you can enjoy companionship in general, friendship. I think, I think of my own life, how much I really enjoy getting together with my brothers. I don't see them very often. We get together, we just have a blast. It's just so much fun. Or when I get together with close friends, the uh, Friday night, we were, we were thinking about some friends from church who we just don't see much lately because of COVID. It, you know, they tend to zoom into church, so we don't, I haven't really had a chance to sit down and talk with them. So we just got together on Zoom and just spent an hour and a half together just having a good time. And there's joy in companionship, isn't there? So let's tie it all together. What are the blessings? Well, we've seen uh, companionship can combat loneliness. It lightens the load. It brings help in times of need. It brings comfort in harsh times. It gives strength in times of danger. It, it, it can bring joy as well. So with, that, with those blessings in mind, let me, let me kind of drive this home to several different groups of us this morning. First, to those of you who are married, it's Valentine's Day after all, so I'll start there. If you're married, remember, you probably do remember, I should say, um, times of great joy you had, particularly when you first fell in love and got married and the honeymoon and all that sort of thing. Of course, if you've been married a long time, you know there are ups and downs. But hopefully, despite the inevitable ups and downs, the Lord has granted you blessings of companionship over the years. For example, hopefully you've had times where your spouse has been there so you were not lonely, or a spouse who lightened your burdens, or your spouse at times gave you help in times of need, or was a comfort in harsh times, or gave strength in danger. Hopefully there have been times of joy in each other's presence. And maybe, maybe you're struggling in your marriage right now, and some are called to very hard marriages. I get that. And so times of blessing may be few and far between. But let me give you an encouragement, if I may. You know, um, we think about the image of the Lord as our husband. We're the bride of Christ. I was thinking as I was thinking about this, you know, and I'll put myself in there. I'm a pretty lousy spouse when it comes to the Lord, right? And yet what does he do? He loves us faithfully. Loves us faithfully and self-sacrificially. So let me encourage you. Whatever your, maybe your marriage is strong. Maybe it's, maybe it has its ups and downs. Maybe it's really struggling. Let me encourage you. By God's grace, and it only is by God's grace, and with his strength, and for his glory, begin to reach out in love. Try to be a companion to your spouse. Try to be, by God's grace, companion who is a blessing to your spouse and who knows but that, that that spouse will indeed reciprocate what about those of you who are no who are not married who are single well again um, what we said about what we said today applies to marriage but it also applies to family relationships and to friendships a good friend can help combat loneliness, can lighten our burdens, can give help in times of need, can give comfort in harsh times, strength in danger, and in part, joys in friendship. I remember um, a man years ago. I was, I was newly married, and um, my parents began attending a church that was a very small church, and they met this man at the church. And this man was, uh, was, was single, wasn't married, never been married. And yet he was such a wonderful, 
wonderful family friend. He became very close to the family. And though I didn't even go to the same church as my parents, and though he only knew me through them, he was, uh, he was so faithful. And uh, when I was thinking about this idea of friendship and just the blessings of companionship, he came to mind. And he died many, he died decades ago now of a heart attack. But, uh, you know, that, wow, he, I have fond memories. I pray that we as a family had been a good friend to him too. So here's the question you can consider this morning. Are you a good friend to family and friends around you? Can your friends, your family, look at you and say that you are a source of blessing to them as a companion? You know, often again, being a good friend can foster good friendships. Let me speak to a third group, and actually this probably pretty much includes everybody. Let me speak to those who are church members. Your know, scripture pictures the church as a family. Scripture pictures us as a body, intimately interrelated to one another. And both of those images, among other things, promote unity and intimacy, and dependence, mutual dependence. And so the picture in Scripture is that the body of Christ is to be a place that's a source of comfort and blessing to the body, those within the body. If we are being Christ-like, then as a body, we to our members can help combat loneliness, lighten burdens, give help in times of need, comfort in harsh times, strength, danger, and impart joys for companionship. Now, it's easy to see that as a corporate level, like the church should, we as a church should do that, or maybe we will say, the leaders should do that. It's not the biblical picture. The biblical picture is that if this church is doing that, means all of us are doing it. I like what Paul says in Ephesians 4.16. He says, you know the body grows? You know when it grows? When each part is working properly to make the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so as a, as a member of the body of Christ, I have to ask myself, am I, as a member of this body, bringing someone in the church at least some of the blessings of companionship as a fellow member of the body? And let me encourage you, too, it can go the other way. If you're lonely or in need or in danger or lacking the joy of companionship, seek out the body. For help. That's what we're here for, isn't it? But let me close with one other group. Everybody, everybody. Here it is. Proverbs 18.24 says, there's a kind of friend who sticks closer than a brother. Well, we all have access to that friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know who that is? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, you're missing out on the greatest friend you could ever have. But if you're a believer, you can rejoice in his companionship. By his grace, he saved you, redeemed you, united himself to you. You belong to him. He loves you. And so rejoice in the blessings of companionship he brings. Blessings already he's done in the past. Blessings he's doing right now and his future guarantee of completing that. So, be grateful. Enjoy whatever blessings of companionship the Lord has given you, whether as a spouse, a friend, or a church member. And certainly as a Christian with the Lord. And let me exhort you to be a companion of blessing with the Lord as your pattern, whether you're a spouse, a friend, or a church member. May the Lord grant us the grace that this would be so. Amen. Father, thank you that you've made us social beings. You've made us 
for each other because we, you've really made us for you and in your image. And Lord, help us to grow in our capacity to be blessings to those around us, whether our spouse or our friends or our fellow church members. Lord, help us to emulate you. And Lord, we know that we cannot ever possibly do this on our own. On our own, we are weak and insignificant, but with your strength and your grace, we can be a reflection of Jesus to others. I pray that we would do that closest to home to begin. I pray this all in your name. Amen.